Okay, welcome back to uh, Beiti Aqua. We are continuing with the uh, Richard Wormbrand Science and Religion discussion. Very, very interesting thoughts coming up with this. Now, we're on page 153 of the Answer to the Atheist Handbook. I do not know how it happened that the Atheist's Handbook refers to Bertrand Russell as a scientist. We know no scientific discovery of his. He is an authority for our opponents because he, dis he subscribed to leftist policies. But because his name has been mentioned, I think we should tell what he wrote about Christianity. There are certain things that our age needs, and certain things it should avoid. It needs compassion. It needs, above all, courageous hope and the impulse to create it. The root of the matter is a very simple and old-fashioned thing, a thing so simple that I am almost ashamed to mention it for fear of a derisive smile with which wise cynics will greet my words. The thing I mean, please forgive me for mentioning it, is love. Christian love or compassion, if you feel this, you have motive for existence, a guide for action, a reason for courage, an imperative necessity for an intellectual honesty. Bertrand Russell, let's read that again. Christian love or compassion, if you feel this, you have a motive for existence, a guide for action, a reason for courage, an imperative necessity for intellectual honesty. Now let us come back to the genuine scientist. C. Chant, professor of astrophysics at Toronto University, says, I have no hesitation in asserting that at least 90% of astronomers have reached the conclusion that the universe is not the result of any blind law, but is regulated by great intelligence. We repeat that if there is an irreconcilable, irreconcilable conflict between, she's sleeping, between science and religion, as atheists assert, most of the scientists themselves know nothing about it. We repeat that if there is an irreconcilable irreconcilable conflict between science and religion, as atheists assert, most of the scientists themselves know nothing about it. Atheists use an, as an anti-religious argument the science of cybernetics, by which they prove all the workings of our mind are like the functioning of a machine. No spirit is implied in either. It is truly marvelous that these cybernetics installations can reproduce or imitate nervous phenomena and that, that they translate, play chess, and solve problems of thought more quickly than man can. But, and this is the point so easily ignored, the cybernetics machine is produced by a mind. In the end, it is simply a reflection of the thought processes of that mind, and not something uniquely new. Men can run, let us say, 10 miles an hour, but they have invented jets and missiles which travel thousands of miles per hour. Men have eyes which perceive at a distance, but they have invented the microscope and the telescope to enable them to see what was hidden from the unaided eye. Men were created with the ability to make tools to extend their cap capabilities and enlarge their senses. The cybernetics machine belongs to this category, but behind every machine there is the mind which constructed it. Who constructed the machine called Atheist Author? Let my opponents pause a bit and ponder the fact that every one of them has at his disposal around 10 billion brain cells. What kind of creator must he be who grants such a profusion of neurons to the one who wishes to mock him? Any brain cell can be in contact with 25,000 others. The number of possible associations is of the order of 10 billion to 25,000 power to the 25,000th power, a quantity larger than the probable number of atoms in the universe known to us. Think further. Each atheist has a thousand miles of blood vessels in his body to supply his brain and organs. To defeat old and proven religion is not an easy task. Our opponents sweat at it. Each atheist author has one and a half million sweat glands on his body surface. He breathes as he writes against religion. He can breathe because he has lungs composed of 700 million cells. 
While he writes against the Creator, his heart beats steadily. It beats many billions of times during his life. In fact, during an average lifetime, it pumps the weight of some 600,000 tons of blood. Could my opponents believe that a crane which lifts such massive tons, tonnage exists by itself without any involvement with an intelligent being? Atheist authors have spent a tremendous amount of nervous energy on their writings. Now, the nervous energy of every one of the authors has three trillion nerve cells, of which nine billion are in the cortex. Furthermore, they could not have written the book if they had been not had been healthy or had not been healthy. Their health was ensured by the 30 million white corpuscles in their veins. They ha also have 130 quadrillion red corpuscles. Doubtless they sometimes took a walk to stimulate their thinking before writing further. It rained, yet no drop of water fell into their nostrils because the opening of the nostrils is downward, not upward. Who arranged for this small detail. Oh, if these academicians only had the wisdom of fishermen known as John, of the fishermen known as John the Evangelist. He wondered about the mystery of his heart, which was beating regularly, assuring the continuation of life. He lay down on the breast of his best friend Jesus, heard the regular beatings of his heart, and so was reassured that there exists a God. Just as the one who hears the regular ticking of a watch knows that there exists a watchmaker. I hope with every fiber of my being that my opponents will also come to know this and know it now. Not in hell, where the truth about God and his universe is finally realized, but too late. From thinking about their own bodily machine, which is much more wonderful than the cybernetics one, let my opponents now turn to, the, uh, to admire a long suspension bridge, yet a spider web strung across a garden path suggested the first suspension bridge. But who gave the spider the intelligence which we admire in the engineer? And who provided it with a web of such remarkable tensile strength? Those who made the first aeroplanes from Leonardo da Vinci to Wright Brothers learned from the birds. But my opponents may be sure that I understand them. They speak in the name of science, which is based on truth. And yet they themselves miss the one great condition of truth, which is free and fair discussion. Suppose that several of the Soviet academicians, academicians, academicians had arrived at religious conclusions, as Einstein and Planck have done. Could they have published a work expressing their convictions? Surely they could have, but only secretly and at the risk of going to prison. We cannot demand much from the authors who write books, who write under such conditions. Not every man is a hero or a potential martyr. The rulers of the communist countries are more in love with their own doctrine than with objective truth, and therefore do not submit it to the only valid test, that of free discussion. Thus they exclude their academicians from right to speak in the name of science. We will give below. Just a few examples taken at random from the Atheist Handbook. I quote, According to the Bible, God has created all the stars, the sun and the moon in the fourth day of creation. Here my opponents have simply added the word all. This one word does not exist in the respective verse of the Bible. The Bible teaches only this, that the stars were created by God. It does not exclude, as the Atheist Handbook says, the appearance of new stars. God has created this universe according to the laws established by him, laws which allow for the possible appearance of new stars. As in other spheres, there appear new men, new plans, and new ideas. Another quotation from the Atheist Handbook. The preachers of religion declare that life has been created by God only on our planet, but science has demonstrated that life is very largely spread throughout uh, the universe. When did the preachers of religion declare that life exists only on our planet? When did science demonstrate the second proposition? Another quotation. The transformation of nature by man shows obviously that the dogma, according to which the world created by God is invariable, has no foundation. The dogma of which religion ever asserted that world, which dogma, the dogma of which religion ever asserted that God 
what God created was invariable. Yahweh 